Welcome to A Break in the Action, where we take a break from the business of our days to focus on outdoor pursuits and the traditional sporting lifestyle. Join us for discussion and interviews on vintage and modern break action shotguns, sporting literature, outdoor leisure, and reviews of best-in-class gear, accessories, and destinations. So pour yourself a drink. Sit back, relax, and let's take a break in the action. Now here's your host, Shotgun collector, wing shooter, and sporting plays enthusiast, Ryan Dowdy. Have you ever considered the question, why do I hunt? For me, that's an easy answer that has a few parts. It allows me to get out and use the shotguns that I so much appreciate. Watching my dogs work and do what they were born to do, what they crave doing, is invaluable. Turning them loose on the high plains, prairie, the north woods, or even a local game preserve immediately transforms them from domestic companions into trembling bird dogs. Third, I crave being in natural places. Spending time in them has a way of refueling me that nothing else I've found yet does. Whether you refer to it as the cure for burnout or taking care of your mental health, finding your own ways to reset and recharge should be of paramount importance to you. This last one is a two-parter and sort of contradictory. I love being able to steal away alone with my dogs for a day in the field, but I also love the camaraderie that you can only get on the road with friends and dogs on a multi-day hunting trip. I live in a part of the U.S. with not much opportunity to wing shoot close to home. I usually have to travel to hunt. My normal destinations are at least six and often 10 hours away. Sometimes even air travel is involved. This being the case, my hunting is typically done in multi-day blocks. Besides the logistics and the added cost, I have to say that I love getting away on a hunting trip, exploring new towns, comparing fields and covers from one year to the next, staying in quaint houses, cottages, and hotels, and just getting to spend extended time with buddies and dogs. What's not to love about that? For me and the groups that I hunt with, the venue often changes from year to year. For some, though, there's a consistent place that calls them back. Whether the accommodations are more primitive or highbrow, the concept of a hunting camp, or specifically a bird camp for this episode, is one that I've been familiar with for years, but I hadn't experienced firsthand. Recently, I got a chance to change that. Joe Schwenke hosts the aptly named podcast Bird Camp. Joe's podcast focuses heavily on grouse and woodcock hunting and conservation in his home state of Michigan. After spending a few days with Joe at his camp and in a few of the grouse and woodcock covers in his area, I wanted to bring him on to discuss what their bird camp experience is like and discuss how Joe focuses on protecting and giving back through local, and I'm going to call it micro, conservation throughout the year. It's always rewarding to see the money you give to large national organizations being used for good conservation work, but that's not the only way to make an impact with your time, talents, and resources. But before I introduce you to Joe, I want to say that one of his latest podcast episodes titled A Bird Camp Editorial should absolutely be required listening for every grouse and woodcock hunter, and I want to encourage each of you listening to check it out. A direct link to that episode is going to be in my show notes. Grouse and woodcock covers are fantastic places and different in so many ways from the other wild places we get to explore and hunt. While we all agree that safety and courtesy to hunters should always be top of mind, This episode discusses real-world examples as to why it is especially important in the grouse woods. Again, I highly recommend you give it a listen. So with that, Joe Schwenke, welcome to the podcast. Glad to be here and talk to you again. Yeah, it isn't often that I've actually met a guest in person uh, before we work on an episode, but you and I did get a meet-up a few weeks ago. I got to spend a couple days with you at your bird camp. You and Chris were good enough to uh, get me out into a few of your covers and also gave me a taste and I'm using that word deliberately, a taste of how you guys do bird camp. Um, we had a ton of fun, and I thought it would be an interesting conversation to have on the uh, on the podcast. And I'm always willing to talk about it. Yeah. that's Yeah, and a little taste is probably so appropriate here yeah. because it wasn't that we had the best bird numbers or anything else either. So you really did get just this little teaser of what it's really like. I, I had a great time. I, di- I didn't shoot very well. 
but hopefully you won't rat me out on here on exactly how bad I shot. I'm actually using that word taste because of how awesome the food that we had um, was, but we'll get into that in just a little bit. I want to talk about your camp. Um, you've been involved in a camp for about how long? How, how many years have you um, had a bird camp running? I measure it in dog years, <laughs> and that's because my dog is 10, okay. which means I've been going to a camp for 12 years. It took two years to figure out that foot hunting was not the future of my bird hunting, and I got a dog. And so D-Man is going to be 10 in January, and that is 10 plus 2. Okay. So in dog years, 12 years, and uh, all up in northern Michigan. And it's, I guess it's just been fun. I, the reason for it was just simply fun. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to do something different. It started out as, a, as an idea of trying to do something new with a camp experience that had been some years between the last deer camp we had had and uh, that deer camp kind of went away when the UP deer herd crashed there in the uh, 12, 16 or so years ago now. So as that population de declined, the DNR did not need us shooting any more deer up there and financially it was no longer a value to go meat harvesting. Um, a few years later, here comes bird camp, you know, where let's go up there. Let's, let's experience things together. And, uh, and it started out with, with me saying, I've rented a cabin. There's X number of beds and here's how many are still available. And if you want to be in the region doing anything, there's a warm bed rented, you know, mm -hmm. pitch in for rent. And that's the first two years were kind of that way. Has your camp, um, evolved any, or would you describe it, uh, that same simplified way today? No, no, it is a night and day difference. Um, the first year I had my wife, my two young twin boys were there. Um, my parents were there. You know, dad had beagles, has beagles still. So they were up there for the hare hunting, you know, and he had remembered hunting birds uh, by foot, just walking up, walking up woodcock and grouse the same way I wanted to do. And so we we hunted with the beagles and when the beagles were tired, we hunted without them hmm. and, uh, food was, you know, good home cooking. Mom did a lot of that. And, uh, we had some game, we had stuff from the canned goods section there at the house and that's kind of how it started. And then a few friends came along. Um, and then it just became kind of evident that the only real way to do this, not to, not to say it really meanly or anything, but, um, the wives stayed home. Mm. We we started doing this as as friends, friends I had met at uh, NAVDA, at, at the dog training group I was in. You know, that's a great place to find uh, somebody. You hit it off well, you get along well, and you say, hey, you want to come hunting with me? Very rarely does somebody say no to that. And then you, right. it turns out that you really do develop a friendship. So some of them are still in camp that came up that way or just... You know, it slowly evolved into, hey, who do you think would really mesh well with this group of guys? Mm -hmm. Oh, I have a buddy with a dog who would love to come up. Well, eventually we find some of them that work out and a few that don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the end, we're, this last camp was eight guys. Um, some of us have been there the whole time, me, uh, my buddy Chris, probably almost as long. A few others at about seven years out of the out of the 12 or 10 and uh, it's it's just turned into a great time of, I think camaraderie is a great word for it. Yep. How how long do you guys typically have your camps? Is it a is it a handful of days? Is it a week? Is it longer than that? For us, normal is in the last few years. It's been Sunday to Sunday. The way the the rental availability mm -hmm. there has worked, um, they say, well, the earliest we can get you in for that week of October that you always want is Sunday. Okay, well, the previous week's renters always wanted it through Saturday, and so it fell that every time we went to renew, the date available was was a Sunday to arrive because the previous group had wanted Saturday to Saturday, and so we've meshed kind of well that way just because we don't care. It works out. Um, and, yeah, so we, we arrive Sunday. We hunt a little bit uh, depending on who is where, it's a four hour drive or closer to an eight hour drive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, over the course of the day, everyone arrives, we get our, our bunks. Um, 
get our dogs all settled, kind of get things arranged in the refrigerator. Of course, you know, it's a rental. It has a full kitchen, um, big enough now for eight guys to sleep comfortably. Um, hot water, heat, all the things that maybe you don't think of as camp. Right. Um, but then again, it snows on you, and you're awful happy about it being warm, dry, multiple hot shower available. You know, there's two full bathrooms there. So those little things start to add up when it it's just that little bit of comfort that makes the experience, I think, better. Sure. You also don't have to plan for any of the other stuff. You bring up your hunting gear. You bring up the things for your dogs. You bring enough ammunition. You don't have to worry about, okay, do I have a rain cover for this? Do I have a ground cloth? Do I have a hammer for tent stakes? Um, how much food? Where is it? How do I cook it? Do I have propane? None of those things have to come into your mind anymore. You know, are we going to be on public land? Do I have to worry about someone taking my stuff? Yeah. All that goes out the window, and you can focus on the birds. Yeah. And I think that's important. Um, anyone that's been on a multi-day hunting trip, you should be putting a lot of miles on your boots each day. Um, so a nice bed and a hot, hot shower, good food is pretty much required just to get yourself rested up and ready for um, the next day. It sounds like most guys have a dog or um, maybe even a few. What's the arrangement with dogs when you have that many guys in camp? Uh, the eight guys that we had come up, between all of us, I think we had somewhere around 16 dogs. Okay. Are the logistics of 16 dogs tough to work out on the trips? I usually take um, the dogs usually spend some time staked out on the chain gang. Um, we've never had 16. How, how does that, how does that usually work out? Yeah, we're all, we're all responsible for our own dogs. Mm -hmm. I brought two, a friend of mine brought four, uh, another one had three, you know, and as it went along, there were two different chain gangs out. Um, one guy brought his dog trailer, eight hole dog trailer, plus crates in his truck. If at any point you needed to, there were open holes in the trailer. There were open crates in the truck. We brought crates for in the house. Mm. We brought crates that stayed in the truck. Um, my dogs are crate trained and I can't stress the importance enough of crate trained. Um, some of these dogs in our group have been used as, as sires. They, they act like sires. Um, some of them think they are, but they're not. Uh, others just don't really know the social boundaries. Right. And some have not figured out the social boundaries between each other yet. Mm -hmm. And so at a certain point, as that dog handler, any of us, um, if we believe our dog is maybe going to be part of a problem, in the crate they go. Yep. They get tons of exercise. It's not like... It, this isn't like they're in jail or anything. Crates are safe. They lay down. They regenerate their their muscles. You know, they they digest their food. They do those things just fine there. Yeah. They don't have to be bothering you. They don't have to cause a fight in the house. They don't have to try to mark territory on the couch. Those those things you don't need to have happen. And in a box somewhere where they're warm and safe is totally acceptable for most of the day. You know, um, you know they run. They go in the crate. Yep. They get exercised plenty. Yep. And uh, hunting typically morning through afternoon, uh, maybe with just a short break for lunch. Does that pretty much sum up the days? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, we, we try to give the grouse enough time to come down out of the trees anyway. Mm -hmm. So if it's a little extra wet, if it's been a little misty, foggy, raining, maybe even some snow, there is zero hurry to hit the woods. Right. And, uh, and to also to kind of stress the importance of it. The golden hour, the best time for grouse, is really the last hour to two hours of the day. Why hurry to go out there to get wet with the dew, to have every aspen tree out there rain on you every time you bump it, only to realize that it's eight hours later that the best hunting is going to be available. Yeah. By then, you're tired and you're out of dog power. Well, take your time getting out. We start... We usually leave the cabin about quarter after nine, maybe nine thirty, sometimes nine o'clock. We've had a nice breakfast. We've got up, we've we've got everything ready. Everyone has kind of rearranged everything in their truck again, topped off water, made sure everything is ready to go for a full day. We usually pack lunches. And so when we hit the woods, yeah, we, we don't have to hurry to be out there, right? We do plan on taking lunches, be there being there majority of the day. Um, 
we do sometimes stop for some sort of a hot lunch. We've found it really enjoyable. It's probably the best way to describe it on top of, I think it helps with the overall experience and there's something about hot food that helps. Mm -hmm. So we bring along a small propane burner, a plastic tote with a pan and a pot and some uh, cardboard cartons of soup, or we fry our, or, you know, we toast our sandwiches, you know, little things like that going off a long way uh, towards just kind of letting you relax. And sure, you, you hunt three, four hours, it's two o'clock, let's have our lunch. It doesn't have to be anything too special. Uh, but then it does turn into special, right? Anyway, right? We're talking a, like a hot ham and cheese sandwich. Oh, yeah. Grilled, you know, with a with a cup of soup and some sausage or crackers or cheese or stuff with it. And, you know, that's fairly substantial compared to some people. But uh, well, it does get you into the rest of the day. And, and anything prepared in the field always tastes better. Let's talk a little bit more about food. You, you guys seem to be pretty serious about your food. Uh, I only had a couple meals with you, but each one was um, completely thought out and, and honestly fantastic. Tell me about your take on the food. What, what's your background with food? And maybe um, what are your, some of your favorite meals that you guys have prepared? Um, how I started out with food is I like to eat <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, but uh, yeah, I, I do like to eat. I was raised on on what my mom calls just plain farm food, which to anyone who sat down to plain farm food, it doesn't come out of a restaurant, but it tastes as good as anything else out there. And so the more and more I like to eat, the more I saw things on food TV and things like that is kind of where I started to get the idea where I can do some of the stuff. It's not that hard to add a little detail to what's already a great dish of just quality food. Um, and so you learn a little bit here and there. Somebody mentions a sauce, somebody mentions a seasoning, and it's kind of off to the races. Um, it started out that way with back in the first early days, we were just eating good food. That's all it was. It wasn't mm -hmm. exquisite. It wasn't picture worthy even um as camp developed away from the more family thing that it was and more into the guys time um it came down to some of us just wanting to do something great and so you know one of the first meals that that my buddy chris did was ribs i'm gonna smoke ribs up here and it takes like four extra hours worth of your yep. day yep. yeah i'm doing ribs anyway oh okay well i'll do pasties then okay well that's a, a up tradition um it some of the examples of what we've done, somebody did stuffed Cornish game hens one year. Um, that was some years ago, so I brought them back again this year and did Thai chili basted Cornish game hen um, with a pheasant. The only thing egg roll about it was the wrapper, but uh, pheasant egg rolls with a French twist, and those were phenomenal enough to do twice. Mm. Uh, we've had... We've had a full country ham dinner. We've had a Thanksgiving dinner. My dad did both of those when he was coming up. Mm. We've had stuffed pork loin, uh, T-bone steaks. There's, oh man, there's so many good things we did. Shrimp and grits, some guys came up and did, and that's an amazing meal. Yep. Um, one of the anecdotal things, though, is we had a gentleman come up that he had been, uh, he was recovering from a cancer surgery. His doctor and his wife then agreed with the doctor that, no, your you, activity level should be minimum. There is no way in, in hell you're going to camp. Four weeks later, she looks over at him, you're going to go to camp. <laughs> like, like, and so he showed up. His meal was a gigantic Stouffer's lasagna. Yep. And everybody in camp has the same attitude towards food. There's an old Clint Eastwood movie where he's this preacher whether he's a gunman faking to be a preacher or not he gets asked to say grace one day and the only thing he can say at the table then is for what we're about to receive may we be truly thankful um and that's really what our guys are you know it, it's we could have this incredible picture worthy awesome menu with with two sides and an appetizer and a dessert and everything is perfectly presented on a plate and the and the thankfulness for it isn't any different with the lasagna, yeah. right? It, it came in a tin and we're all sitting down, we're eating, enjoying somebody's contribution um, without really looking at it differently. I think that's, that's important. Um, we do this because we voluntarily do that. It's not forced that we make it a great meal. Um, 
I also had the biggest catastrophe in camp a couple of years ago. <laughs> I, uh, I ruined like it had to have been 10 grouse breasts. <laughs> and, uh, and I was the first one to admit it too. Like my first bite, I'm like, I need to go apologize to the grouse gods. Cause this one's a mess. Oh um, no. I'm not going to blame the chef and the cookbook it came out of because everything else I've ever eaten out of that cookbook is great. Um, and I just simply overcooked the grouse by five minutes, maybe. Mm. And it was supposed to simmer. And by the time that I figured it out, I realized it was too late. I had ruined, yeah, like five birds. Oh, brother. And, uh, it's, uh, and, they, and they don't always let me forget either. Like, you remember <laughs> that time when, when you ruined all those grouse we shot? Yeah. 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 yeah I, I'm the first one to remember. <laughs> Is there any sort of um, one-upsmanship with what you guys pick to make? I think we try to better ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, there's um, one guy's been coming for about seven years. He was on uh, my podcast recently, and uh, he brings tacos. Every year, it's tacos. Everybody in camp loves taco night. <laughs> now, it's not your normal taco night. That's homemade guacamole homemade pico like four bags of chips usually you're you're full from the salsa and the guac before the meal's even really ready and uh you know there, there's plenty to eat there and every year we look forward to taco tuesday and uh when we divide out who does what on what night it's just kind of obvious that that's when tacos are and uh you know that that's that's his dinner that's what he's happy with and, and comfortable with but at the same time, then a guy like me is like, okay, I did really good last year. I wonder what can I do better, right? Now, so, now be honest with me. You're elevating your game every year to try to erase the memory of the five grouse um, that, that you ruined. Uh, you're sort of paying penance. If if I could come up with a dish that would erase that from someone's memory, <laughs> I would practice that recipe 50 times before <laughs> camp. Like it would be per, it would be Gordon Ramsay perfect. Perfect. Yep. Um, to, to erase that one. Um, but I don't think I'm ever really going to live down ruining grouse au vin. So no, but, but the pheasant egg rolls that, that it's really a French egg roll with some pheasant in it, but my goodness, that was good. Um, sometimes I make a custard pie. Um, I have not decided yet to make a homemade ice cream up there, but that's always in my back pocket. Um, friend Dave always comes up with an exquisite something or, or other, um, and I think we do try to up, up ourselves a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, some either a new technique or a new idea. You try it once, you take it to camp and do it again. And uh, that I, I think that, yeah, the competition really is between just me and myself. Yeah. Yeah. I think the summary of this is that it's just everything from the hunting experience to um, the regular guys that keep coming back to the food it's these memories that are made and just the ability um, for each of you to just enjoy yourselves and to kind of um, recharge. On one of your recent podcasts, you and your guests spoke about this and even used the term mental health. And I think it's really important that we all find these things that allow us to recharge and detach from all the stress and clutter um, and busyness of our daily lives. That's a huge part of it, isn't it? It's I think it's an important thing. Let's touch on that a little bit for two aspects. We love having fun up there. We love the birds, the dogs and stuff. When you start to talk about camaraderie among men, there there should be something more than that, right? Friendship should be more than just this superficial thing that we do. And, I, and I'll maybe ruffle some feathers here, but that superficial thing that we do called hunting, you know, where else can a guy go where he can go up there to camp sit down at the end of the day and someone says, okay, so, so how are you doing? Mm -hmm. Are you, are you good at home? As, you know, how, how have things been? Well, if, if it's just one of those things where you only ever do stuff with birds, dogs, guns, stuff like that, he'll never be able to tell you how hard it has been lately to parent a teen. Mm -hmm. Well, what good's your friendship then? So yeah. I'll throw that out there that this, you know, camp should be able to be more. It needs to be more because where else is somebody who has been the strength of the family uh, supposed to find strength? Right. You know, so so that's one of those things, too. And, yes, the getting away from 
all the responsibilities just to literally recharge, to enjoy some downtime. Um, the the importance of that, you know, the yeah, I I hundred percent agree. I, I think that it also gives the opportunity to mentor and to be mentored. And I'm not just talking about with shotgunning skills, but but with life. Life can be hard and it's stressful. Um, I know that that even on the short uh, the few short day trip that I got up your way, my work got super complicated and I had to leave later than I wanted to. And I was on the phone with clients for most of the drive up. It had been a really stressful week, but that little bit of time spent away with guys and dogs, I left you guys completely recharged. Um, now, this will be a pretty quick change of topics, but since this is a shotgun-focused podcast, you've got a pretty great shotgun, and I know that you had a little bit of a journey um, involved in getting it. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, I'll, I'll talk about shotguns, definitely. <laughs> um, I've... At a certain point, I suppose, more than some years ago, um, more than just a rabbit hunter, I was working with some guys that started to shoot at a gun club and uh, got involved with them. In fact, I worked with one today that was in that club with me at the time, and we just started shooting skeet, and it was it was just fun. We did it as a hobby, night or two after work, and uh, and then if things got a little competitive, we started, started betting on it. Um, the place we were at served served food and beer. And so at the end of our run, we'd shoot two lines of skeet. The first one, the loser bought a round of burgers. Second one, we'd bet a round of beers. And we'd call it a night after that. Yep. And uh, if you weren't careful, a twenty two was going to cost you about 30 bucks. <laughs> burgers there were, you know, five bucks a piece, a little bit more than that. You have to tip the, the cook and the, the, the lady behind the counter. So... All of a sudden, that $7 line of skeet or $6 line of skeet was going to be real bad if you couldn't <laughs> break at least 22 targets or someone had to fall apart. And so there was a combination of if I can trash talk my way into not being last, that's kind of how it started. Um, moving forward, as we started hunting, getting my dog, things like that, I had a cabinet full of Satori's and uh, nothing wrong with them. I still shoot them great and uh, and highly recommend them. You know, for the guy that just wants to shoot on a, on a fairly regular basis. Mm -hmm. But uh, it got in my head that I wanted a bird hunting gun, and nothing said bird hunting gun like European game gun. Mm -hmm. And I, I tried to handle some early American stuff, and nothing felt right in my hands. Even if it fit, there's something about the way that the LCs and the Fox, and now they'll, they'll crucify me later on my podcast about this, I just... They don't fit right. They don't feel right. There's something in my hands that just says, this gun's a Ford Taurus. Um, <laughs> and that, I didn't get that. Um, I'll, 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 add your, I'll add your email for comments to the show notes on that for all the, the guys in the L.C. Smith Collector Society. And I, I love looking at those guns, right? <laughs> and I love shooting with those guys. Um, you know, the side-by-side -side group around here in Michigan is, is active, too. And uh, and. And I, I, well, the guy in camp there has a beautiful AH Fox upgrade on the wood. I mean, it was a fantastic gun for him, A grade, and uh, it just does not feel right. And I, well, it's just me then. I can't, I can't get it to work for me. And I stumbled uh, eventually. I thought I was going to settle in about that three thousand dollar range, find something nice, and I wanted it because. When you looked at those guys that shot the LCs, the Parkers, or even, you know, looking back in some of our historical stuff, the Churchills and things like that, these guys spent as much as they could afford responsibly on a gun. A gun, just one. Maybe two at the most. And this is pre pre Gene Hill writing because he's convinced everybody to spend on multiple guns, but guys like Burton Spiller here wouldn't wouldn't buy a second one why bother i have this gun this is a nice one and i'm keeping it mm -hmm. and uh and they you know at the time they spent a lot of wages on it and so i said well i'm gonna buy a gun it's going to be my gun i'm going to either get it fitted or learn to shoot it well and i started shopping i looked through my cabinet at what i could sell to fundraise and i stumbled onto a gentleman in pennsylvania selling a 20 gauge Merkel EL grade side by side. Uh -huh. And uh, 
I messaged him back. I said, hey, you have the gun I want. I'm in the middle of a gun yard sale, and uh, can you hold on to it for me? He said, I'll hold on to it, absolutely. You know, tell me when you've raised the money. Wow. And so I went to the cabinet, and I'd already been selling a few, looked at the rest of the guns I didn't use. There were deer rifles and target pistols and a couple of shotguns here and there, and, and then that group of Satori's that I liked. All right, I don't care how many of you need to be sold in whichever order it's in, but I'm getting my money. Yeah. And uh, sure enough, got it, sent it off, had the FFL information all in place. You know, they sent it down to my local dealer and uh, bought it, took it out to the club, said, okay, I'm going to shoot ski. Shot a 22. Mm. Straight up, well, straight up, yep. Straight out. Now, I was, I had just come off of a league league year, league winter league, and I was averaging about a 24 at the time. So a 22, I was like, well, considering it's a totally different barrel configuration on a gun I didn't even know would fit me or not, I'm pretty darn happy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can't say enough about having good guys at good clubs. I was hell-bent immediately on, it's a fixed choke barrel. You know, I've improved and modified, just like the Germans would say you need, mm-hmm. and and you should believe them. And uh, I, I wanted choke tubes put in that gun so bad. And uh, another guy there has one similar to mine, and he says, shoot it a year before you spend any money. Just shoot it a year and forget about the chokes. Within six months, I had convinced myself at that point that I don't need choke tubes. Yeah. Just get the beat ahead of the bird, look the bird in the eye, hit the trigger. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, I no longer needed any of these new gadgets called yep. choke tubes. Yep. yep. I've, I've definitely been guilty of that. I'll tell you, this is going to be a little bit of an aside, but anyone that listens to this podcast knows that I probably have um, a diagnosable problem with shotguns. I enjoy them a ton, um, but I'm really starting to get this sort of dissatisfied feeling. And and this isn't a feeling of dissatisfaction in that I want more guns. It's, it's really kind of the opposite of that. It's a feeling of dissatisfaction in the fact that I don't just have one or two that I shoot the very best that I'm able to. I've got a handful of shotguns that are all sort of transient um, with me, and, and I'd say that I shoot each one um, pretty good and sometimes even really good, but not consistently really good. That's just hard to do when I change them out so often. Um, every time I leave the house to hunt or shoot, part of the fun for me has been to take something new, try it out, and, and just get some time with it in the field. Um, that's starting to be less interesting to me, I think. Your, your Merkel and the way that you knew that gun and the way that you shot that gun uh, really got me thinking um, more about making some sort of a change. Your little 20-gauge Merkel, it's like a Model 147 EL, something like that, I'm thinking. Yes, or is. Okay. 26-inch mm-hmm. barrels? 28? Do you remember what they are? 28. Okay. 28. Because I mean, shorter doesn't make it better. Right. It, but it, I mean, it was a... It didn't have that normal, overly mm-hmm. chunky, heavy um, feeling that that old Merkel that I had. And, and the one I had years ago wasn't nearly as nice as, as yours, and it was a 12-gauge. Um, but anyway, that, that, yeah. I, I thought it was a beautiful gun. I like the story, and I like, um, I like the fact that I, I like it when guys really invest in their gun. And even if it's not perfect for you that day you know you thought the day that you got it out right at the beginning that you know it needed this and it needed that but if you just spend time with it and you get used to it and you get to know it and it gets to know you you know there's nothing wrong with fixed chokes there's nothing wrong with single trigger there's nothing wrong with double trigger i mean i just had a guy Mm -hmm. today message me you know and he's kind of new in the in the shotgun buying game he asked me you know how hard is it to you know learn how to um hunt with a double trigger gun and I mean, it's not hard at all. I mean, you know, you, anything that you just invest some time into and getting familiar with, um, mm-hmm. you get used to it, you know? Um, so anyway, yeah. I thought, I thought that was a, I thought that was a good little, um, tangent to, yeah. to run down yeah. really quick. The only exception to the one kind of a gun rule. I don't know that I could do a gun. I'm talking I about can't. less, I'm talking about less guns. Less gun. In my case, I still could not do an a gun and that's only because I duck hunt. Yeah, yeah. And I also grouse hunt then in whatever weather happens to be the day camp's at. 
Yeah. So I have a beater Benelli or two here that one fits better than the other. And when the weather's nasty and I'm in my rain gear or I'm in a duck marsh, I, I take out the gun that I can afford to, to lose right. more than the, more than the other to um, drown. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I have, and I have dropped them in, in muck water. Mm-hmm. I've, I've I've abused those guns and they they withstand that they shoot well and again too I don't understand your infatuation with more <laughs> um I, when you get when you get one that you can just about say is the gun yeah the rest of them seem much less fun to play with well well as a lame defense I think in my mind I have them in categories I I have some that check boxes in what I want my collection to be and then I have others that are that are my hunting and my shooting guns um, I, I do shoot all of my guns, but there are some um, that I would never take out in the grass. Was I'd never take out in the rain, um, for that matter. Uh, I have actually had kind of a funny episode idea for years. That would be something like the perfect three shotgun collection. But each time I get started on thinking on what those three shotguns would be, I kind of throw my hands up in the air and, and agree that it's just a kind of a stupid idea. Maybe maybe one of these days I'll get that sort of an episode out out there well you call me back because that's about a six minute conversation (laughs) (laughs) i can do it (laughs) all right well let's let's transition now into a different topic that i know that you and i have talked about a lot um this is something that i think that you do different than than most it's it's with regards to your mindset on conservation um you have more of a focus on local, maybe even micro conservation, ways that you can actually do things that translate into results that you can actually see firsthand. Talk to me for a few minutes about what you're doing with regards to conservation. It started because I had a coworker that absolutely got annoyed at me for talking about this stuff. <laughs> he, uh, we, we, normally we work together, we, and we work close together the whole day over and over and over again. And he said, and he's about to the point where he's like, you got to stop talking about this some or find an outlet for it. Maybe that's to be more precise, be constructive with your chatting at this stuff. And so while I was off finishing up working on some stuff, he had taken my tablet and on Facebook created the Michigan Upland experience. And then he handed it over back to me and he said, Hey, you're the admin of this new page now. Um, (laughs) Now you have an outlet. And so I, you know, picked the cover photos and I, I found some friends that also hunted that we were all fairly like-minded. Um, so we now have five of us total on there. And uh, how this is conservation-minded really was the focus of that started out is if I can post a picture of good habitat, I can help a new hunter find birds. Mm-hmm. I can also find, I can show that new habitat to somebody who may be not a hunter at all but hates clear cuts and show a picture of a six year clear cut and show all the diversity in that, that life giving area, right? The, the new regeneration of young Mm -hmm. forest. I can post on there things like, Hey, there's an event coming up like uh, one just coming up this weekend, women on the wing sort of event where a woman who's interested in pheasants can come and see bird dogs and get a bird and, and eat one and and see what it's really all about with other women right things like that i can i can do all those things from the page and the four or five of us do that um along the way we we take videos we do the little things that would hopefully encourage people to keep going try it uh try new places um we show us out with our kids sometimes because that's a huge part of the future of hunting and conservation really is how well we pass this on so that's kind of where that part started there. Along the way, how do we get a good contribution, which I know where you're going with this. Um, the Michigan Upland Experience needed something to do that was that would have an effect on the ground. Um, and we said, well, well, since we're Michigan-based, all of us are Michigan guys, let's raise some money for some Michigan stuff. And at the time, uh, the Rough Grouse Society, they still have it now. It's called the Drummer Fund. And that money is for habitat purposes in Michigan. That's usually where it stays year to year. Some of it gets used, some of it doesn't. um, And people can apply for that money. So the first year we said, let's let's do something where we can do that. And uh, the idea had come earlier about 
meeting somebody wherever they wanted to in the state and serving them a three course meal for four. Um, we call it the Upland Field Lunch. And the idea had kind of come from some old plantation quail pictures where people had a table, tablecloth, chairs out there in the field where, you know, dogs were still crated on the trailer, things like that. And they sat down with picnic baskets and they had this, this nice lunch there uh, in the middle of their hunting. I said, well, I can do something like that. I have the Dutch ovens. I have cast iron pans. You know, it takes a, a grill or a griddle and a, and a hot fire and you can do kind of the same thing except like you know like our normal lunch in the field hot food except we can raise the bar on that hot food and this came the first lunch we did was actually a bet in a march madness pool that uh one of our admins steven won um and so we my partner from kalamazoo chris and i from grand rapids at the time then drove five hours to meet him and his wife in one of their favorite covers up there in the eastern up hmm. and served them three courses of food in the parking area of one of his covers hmm. and that's what started it the following year the upland experience took the idea ran with it auctioned one off and for 250 dollars that went into the drummer fund uh, that was our first one back in 2018 i'm kind of looking at a little note card i have here on my desk with it and that was pretty neat we thought wow, that's something we can do. You know, it doesn't take a lot to put together. The first menu was like a pork tenderloin with peppers. Um, we had like a sausage biscuit roll for an appetizer. And I made a pie for dessert. Pretty simple. Um, we've come a long way since then even. And the prices went up. There's been some competition for this item. We limit it to only a handful now. And since 2018, we've raised now $14,000 for either Michigan bird habitat or upland related hunting opportunities. Um, there's one actually coming up. We helped some, a veteran group raise some money for some of their activities. One of which would be a veteran and youth pheasant hunt that's coming up the 12th here on Sunday. Those pheasants were purchased with money that we raised for them through a raffle. Hmm. And it's going to be exciting. I get to be there, right? I'm running my dogs. And so these people in front of me, they're going to have a veteran and a kid with them together where they can mentor and experience this as a, a team as usually as a family even. And, uh, that seems to be the importance really in the hunting community of our future is the adult and the parent, the adult parent or the uncle or grandpa and the next generation, um, doing something together is really the best way forward. And uh, it's a unique experience for them. It's giving back to our vets who've no doubt spent years away from their family at some point in their career over the last 20 years. So, hey, you missed a year with your kid, but I can get you six birds in an afternoon in a pheasant field. Mm. You know, it's not exactly saying enough thank yous, but it's a good start. Sure. Yep. And, uh, and in the meantime, hopefully they, they bond over this a little bit and then, hey, you want to try that again? yeah, it was fun. Let's do it. You know, so hopefully it's, it's both recruitment and, uh, and that way of giving back to our vets. That's just this one example here. We've done sharp tail habitat in the UP, uh, where we auctioned it off. We've done stuff more with the rough grouse society from Southern uh, Michigan woodcock habitat regeneration. Um, we've put together part of a project that needed a little bit of extra funding at the end, um, for some Michigan pheasants on some state land some years ago, we helped with that. And gave and we raised just enough money to fully fund the last part of the project, and they were able to close that out. Um, there's been, there's just been some great stuff, yeah. and and every I, time we do it, it gets a little better. I think the thing that I like most is that you have all these projects going on, and you're delivering tangible results that you actually get to see. With with conservation, um, we usually think of that as as what we can do for habitat. Uh, but you also apply that word conservation to protecting and promoting hunting. Just in the past five minutes, you've talked about organ organizing events to introduce women to hunting, um, events focusing on giving back to veterans by organizing special days in the field, um, events geared towards educating young hunters. Plus, you obviously um, focus on growing and restoring habitat. That's all coming from you and just a handful of individuals that are that are local to you. That's really impressive and definitely something that more of us should emulate. 
Um, is that a pretty fair summary of how you view your role with, with uh, conservation? Yeah, I think that's exactly it. Really, there's we really are four or five committed people that just decided not to quit. Mm-hmm. You know, we've seen success and, you know, so, and, and at least we've seen, and we've seen growth too, right? This last auction was a $1,500 Facebook auction. And uh, that money went from the bidder's hand directly into the hand of a habitat chair at a rough grouse society chapter. Uh, receipts were put in the right hands. People got the right tax credits. All the things happened there uh, for full accountability, which I want to, to put in there too, as far sure. as, We've raised $14,000 and I have not put a fingerprint on any of it. And I learned this from an old pastor a long time ago. The best kind of accountability is where you are so far beyond beyond suspicion, right? That people wouldn't even think of looking at you. You've got so many layers to keep you protected between you and a possible allegation. So that's what we have here. You know, you bid on the lunch, you get the lunch. We tell you where to send your check to who it needs to be made out to. And that person has the accountability of a national organization or some such entity there that can get you the proper receipt. And in the end, you're a donor. He's a receiver of the money. And I simply show up at the appointed time with a pile of food and serve you a fantastic meal. That that's a really nice working scenario but along the way right the first lunch was 250 bucks yeah all the way now to 1500 um we had a a raffle organized last year that ran 3600 bucks and that was for hunter opportunity for veteran opportunity with that same group we worked with again all it takes really is a willingness to say and there there is some sacrifice right this isn't easy um somebody says they want a lunch in the central up that's two days of my time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, it, it takes, it takes some work. It takes prep work. Um, if I change a recipe, you know, we kind of get stuck in a rut, but that rut is usually first class quality. Mm-hmm. But if I change something in the desserts, I test it on my family first. <laughs> I make sure that I can do this not only in a full kitchen, I can do it in 40 degree October afternoon with the wind blowing. And then, plan for it to be 40 and blowing when I do it, you know, there's, there's that going into it there. And, uh, I don't know, am I allowed to, to mention our sponsors? Absolutely. You bet. Yeah. Okay. Um, cause the food isn't free mm-hmm. and at some points we've done two of these a year. So the Upland, uh, gear company, Pike gear, sure. uh, has come on board and they donate enough money for the food. Um, and that's, complete three courses we've this year uh picked up with frontiers edge outdoors which is that veteran group we like to work with and we had said we needed some venison backstrap for venison steak diane and uh one of their leadership members said okay how much backstrap do you need he lives over in the thumb of michigan and they call deer from the farms and i said well i'm i'm feeding four people plus uh, a couple others. Okay, I'll bring you like seven packages. Is that going to be enough? Yeah, that should do two meals rather well. <laughs> uh, and it did. But, you know, so they've picked up the the thing of making sure we have that venison pike gear, of course, then foots the rest of the bill. Um, and if anything else needs paid for, a friend of ours named Dave covers the rest, um, and he's happy to do so. He's also my my backup plan when I panic and I need a recipe idea in the middle of Myers when I'm buying ingredients. <laughs> but, uh, you know, everyone has a mentor, and Dave is, in a way, uh, my culinary sensei, so to speak. <laughs> and, uh, but, yeah, you know, it, it takes guys that, uh, that are just good support around me. No one else likes to talk about it. I can't get them on a podcast or anything like that. But, uh, you know, some of the other guys there contribute through videos and, and other ways, and, you know, they may not know how to cook something, but they clear the plates, they they pour the the wine course, or they wash this between courses, or they get the cutting boards ready again. There's there's so much that goes into three courses to be perfectly timed. Yeah. And uh and usually there's three of us to pull it off. Well, I think what you're doing is great, and I know that it can't be easy. Um, I'm sure you'd be happy with as many listers as possible copying some of what you're doing, or at least copying your spirit 
um, and making an impact on their own local to them parts of the country. Joe, this has been a great talk. Um, where can listeners follow all that you're involved in? Um, the podcast is Bird Camp, all mm-hmm. one word. Um, you can find it probably right next to a break in the action on Spotify. And uh, the other one that we really like the shares the f- and, uh, and some traffic on, too, is the Michigan Upland Experience. Um, it's just on Facebook. It's just there as a way of hopefully helping mm-hmm. people find grouse, find woodcock, um, learn about habitat, learn about the importance of what that habitat really means for game and non-game species. Um, if you're in Michigan, you can kind of follow along, see some of the things we're doing, um, see those meals, right? The, the food pictures come in there as well. And uh, you can follow along on the on the show Michigan Outdoors when we're on there sometimes as well. But uh, I'm Joe Swanky on Facebook. I, you can always follow from there a little bit, but the bird camp um, also has a lot of the same content there. And uh, JS20 Boar on Instagram is yeah. me. But uh, again, that, that Michigan Upland experience is really, um, we're quite literally, we're cheerleaders for, for what we love doing. Mm-hmm. Well, it, so, so yeah, and we try to try to make it our mission. We're just, and we're simple guys, right? There's nothing special about us. And I've said that a number of times to other people. We're, we're just not quitting. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we found something we're good at that seems to be successful and, uh, all of us work for a living. There's nothing crazy about us. Um, we're just doing our little part. Yep. Yep. Joe, you're the real deal. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you. And thank you for having me. This episode has been a bit different, but I think we've talked about some important and I hope interesting things. As always, I appreciate you listening. If you're enjoying this podcast, make sure to leave a review and share it with a friend. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of A Break in the Action. Want to hear your voice on a future episode? Leave a message, ask a question, or suggest a topic on our listener line at 317-662-4520. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Facebook, and visit us at abreakintheaction.com.